Next speaker is uh, Josh Cudby um, from Cambridge, and he's going to tell us about Gaussian decomposition of magic states for match gate computation. Okay, hi everyone. Um, first of all, just thank you to the conference organizers for putting on such a great conference. So yeah, uh, today I'm going to be talking about Gaussian decomposition of magic states for match gate computations, and this was joint work done with my supervisor, Sergei Strachuk. Okay, so just to create a quick outline of what I'll talk about today. Um, we're gonna start with some background and motivation. So I'll talk a little bit about classical simulation of Clifford circuits, and then I'll give some background on what match gate circuits are and match gate computations. I'll then talk about Gaussian states. So I'll give some definitions. Um, I'll then talk about algebraic constraints on Gaussian states, and I'll qu talk quickly about the Gaussian fidelity. Um, and then finally, I'll talk a little bit about match gate circuit simulation, and in particular, the Gaussian rank. So let's get started. Um, so what do I mean by classical simulation of quantum circuits? Um, so traditionally, we've got two types of simulation. We have weak simulation, which are algorithms which take a description of a circuit and samples from the output distribution. And we have strong simulation, where we have algorithms that take a description of a circuit and compute any desired output probability or marginal output probability. Um, and as you might expect, strong simulation implies weak simulation. Um, so for the purpose of this talk, we're just gonna assume simulation means strong simulation. Okay, um, so what are Clifford circuits? Uh, so the Clifford group is the set of gates which preserve the Pauli group under conjugation and they're explicitly generated by the Hadamard gate, the C0 gate, and the phase gate S. And we have this very celebrated theorem that if you have a quantum circuit which acts on a computational basis state, consists only of possibly adaptive Clifford gates and contains measurements only in the computational basis, then that quantum process is classically efficiently strongly simulable. And just for some notation, we call states prepared by Clifford circuits stabilizer states. So since Clifford circuits are classically simulable, they don't achieve universal quantum computing, but we can extend them to a more powerful gate set in a couple of different ways. The kind of most obvious way is to give them access to a new gate. So for example, the T gate, which I've defined up there, it's the square root of the phase gate S. Um, then the gate set Clifford plus T is actually universal. Um, but instead, we can actually give them access to a different resource. We can give them access to so-called magic states. So if we define this state A, um, which looks kind of like a T gate in some sense, um, we actually have this small Clifford subroutine, which consumes a copy of a magic state A to implement a phase gate uh, T. So how do we do that? We take the line we actually want to put our T gate on, and we take one copy of an ancilla, we apply a C naught, we take a measurement in the computational basis, and then we do this correction operator dependent on the outcome of this measurement. Um, and if you go through and actually check that, you can see that this exactly implements a T gate. And since having access to these states A boosts the power of Clifford gates to a universal set, um, somehow magically, they're known as magic states for Clifford circuits. Now, how does this relate to classical simulation? Um, so here's a simulation algorithm based on this idea. We first express any quantum process you like in terms of a Clifford plus T circuit. Then we gadgetize the circuit. So we replace all the T gates with those small subroutines I showed earlier. And the result of doing that is some circuit C acting on still n copies of the zero cat, but now also k copies of the magic state, where k is the number of T gates in the gadgetized circuit. Now we can imagine expressing this k copies of the magic state in terms of a big sum of k qubit stabilizer states. Now for each term in this decomposition, if we consider them separately, um, the quantum process is now a Clifford circuit C acting on a stabilizer state. And by the gottesman knill theorem, which I showed earlier, this is efficiently simulable. 
Now, of course, there's no such thing as a free lunch. We've not just solved um, simulating quantum processes in poly time. So what is the complexity of this? So the complexity is, is dominated by the number of terms in the decomposition. So we call the number of terms the stabilizer rank. It's given by this expression chi here. And it's the minimum possible number of terms in any such decomposition. And since we expect simulating quantum processes to be exponentially hard, we expect that T should scale like two to the alpha K for some constant alpha. Uh, now, if you just do this naively in the computational basis, we have two to the K terms, so uh, alpha equals one. But actually, if you do something more clever, the kind of best known decomposition, at least best known to me, gives alpha something like 0.4. So there's actually really tangible benefits to finding better decompositions for doing these simulations. Yeah, so this um, alpha one is made by combining these like cat states together. It's um, quite non-trivial, but it does end up with quite a good decomposition. Okay, so I'm now gonna change tack completely and give some background on match gates and match gate circuits. Um, so a match gate is this rather strange looking two qubit gate. Um, it's got two parts, it's got an A and a B, and A acts on the even parity subspace, so the naught naught and the one one, and B acts on the odd parity subspace, so the naught one and the one naught gets. Um, and A and B both have to be unitary, and crucially, they have to have the same determinant. Now, circuits of nearest neighbor match gates are known as match gate circuits. And actually, nearest neighbor is really important here. You can uh, check that the swap gate is not actually a match gate because the determinants don't match up. So giving access to swap gates is actually giving these circuits more power. So we enforce nearest neighbor. Um, now, match gate circuits are efficiently classically simulable. And in some sense, this is because they're very closely linked to the theory of non-interacting fermions, which is a solvable physical model. Um, and I actually think this is really interesting because in some sense, Clifford group is a really nice mathematical structure, but it's not that well physically motivated. Whereas match gate circuits are kind of directly physically relevant theory. So just to kind of delve into that a little bit more, if we have a system of N free fermions, we associate with them these creation operators, A1 dagger to AN dagger. But actually, mathematically, it's much easier to work with uh, two N operators called the Majorana operators. And they're defined up here. There's a kind of um, odd one and an even one, which is slightly different. And the gamma mu are chosen to be Hermitian, square to the identity, and mutually anti commute. Um, and just to put some like, concreteness on this, one particular representation of them is the so called Jordan Wigner representation, in which they're just these very simple Pauli strings of a bunch of Zs and then either an X for the odd case or a Y for the even case. And just to kind of show the link between match gate circuits and these Majorana operators, uh, match gate circuits actually act as rotations on the Majoranas. So when we conjugate a Majorana by a match gate circuit, we end up with this action over here where Q is a special orthogonal matrix. Um, so traditionally, this is how people have worked with match gates in terms of kind of the action on the Majoranas. Now, once again, we can extend match gate circuits to a universal set. And I actually mentioned this earlier that the swap gate gave match gate circuits more power and it actually turns out that it gives them sufficient power to be universal. And once again, we have a small subroutine, which um, instead of giving them a swap gate, we can use this subroutine and a certain magic state to perform a swap gate. Now it's not quite as nice as the Clifford one, so I'm just gonna flash it, but don't feel the need to kind of pass the circuit too much, but you can go in and check that this is in fact an adaptive match gate circuit. Um, now, what is the magic state that we care about? Um, for us, we're gonna take this very simple state. It's just a four qubit GHC state. Um, and I'll actually check that it's magic later, but you have to take me up my word for now. Okay, so that gives some kind of background and motivation. Um, so let's talk a little bit now about Gaussian states. 
So a Gaussian state is defined to be a state which is prepared by a match gate circuit acting on the zero ket. Um, and it's actually known that any state of fixed parity, so only contains computational basis states with an even number of ones, say, um, any non-Gaussian state of fixed parity is known to be magic for match gate circuits, which is quite a powerful result. Um, and we also have this classification of Gaussian states uh, given by Sergei Bravi. Um, and we take two copies of each Majorana operator and tensor them, sum over all the Majoranas and act on two copies of a state. And a state is Gaussian if and only if the resulting expression is zero. Now, equation one is quite a nice kind of compact representation, but it's not very useful to actually get a grip on what these Gaussian states look like. So we can expand equation one in the computational basis to get a sort of explicit set of algebraic constraints. Um, and these, ex these explicit constraints are super useful to actually get a better handle on the manifold of the states and to do all our later work. Um, but warning, the equation looks a little bit scary. So what happens? We end up with this big mess where we have a sum over odd weight strings and then inside that, we have a sum over the length of the string or the, the number of qubits. And we have this nasty looking expression. But actually, it's not that scary. We have, as I said, one constraint per odd weight pair. And each, each equation has a term for each bit i where xi does not equal yi. And actually, if the Hamming distance between the two strings is less than or equal to two, the constraint is trivially satisfied. So. For example, if you only have four qubits, it actually turns out there's only a single constraint and it looks like this. So I flipped between binary and decimal here just because I didn't want to write out loads of binary strings. So forgive me for that, but it's actually not too scary. It's just this alternating sum of quadratic terms. So why are we interested in this? So the manifold of just all even weight states is just parameterized by all these, all these variables a mu. It's very simple. Whereas the manifold of Gaussian states at, so far is parameterized by all these complicated constraints. And we have loads of them. But ignoring duplication, there is this like sort of nasty combinatorial number of non-trivial constraints. And actually this is too many constraints. If they were all independent, we wouldn't have any Gaussian states, but we know that it is possible to prepare states with match gate circuits. So clearly not all these equations are independent. Now, how are we gonna find an independent set? I'm gonna to appeal to something called the implicit function theorem. And if you've not seen this before, all you really have to care about is that it essentially says that imposing M independent constraints removes N degrees of freedom. And if you want a slightly more technical version, Essentially, we have, m plus, we have m functions on m plus n variables. So we partition our variables into two sets. And if the Jacobian of the functions with respect to the first set of variables is non-zero at some point, then there is some solution of the w's in terms of the z's. So essentially, the w's become dependent variables and the z's remain independent variables. Now, how do we apply that in our case? So we have this large set of functions, f indexed by the odd weight strings, x, y. Um, we partition the variables into w, which is the set indexed by heavy weight strings, and z, which is the set indexed by low weight strings. And we now need to find a set of um, m functions that we think are independent. And how do we do that? We, for each W, which is heavyweight, we find its first one, and then we take the constraint function fx y equals zero, where x is just the a single one in that first bit, and y is the string W, but with its first bit kind of unset and changed to a zero. And if you actually go through and do the calculations, you can end up seeing that the Jacobian is block upper triangular, and the blocks on the diagonal are just multiples of the identity. Um, so in particular, the IFT holds and we have an independent set of constraints. Um, um, it's 
sort of for any for any amplitude which is non-zero, you can pick a set around that one. So you kind of have this like patched local version to get it globally. Um, it's a little bit technical, so I'm not going to go into it here. Um, so what can we do now that we have this kind of explicit and small description of Gaussian states? So one thing we can prove is that the Gaussian fidelity is generally exponentially small. Now, what's the Gaussian fidelity? It's very simple. It's just the maximum overlap of the state you care about with any Gaussian state phi. Now, so yeah, for a whole random state, we can show that the probability of having non-negligible overlap is actually exponentially small. And just to sketch the proof, we use the constraints that we found, the independent set, um, to construct an epsilon net with size not too bad, essentially. Um, now, two to the poly n kind of looks bad, but it, it all shakes out in the end. And then we use properties of the Haar measure, and we take a union bound over that net to show that with high probability, the fidelity um, of any state on the net is exponentially small. And then the fidelity of any general Gaussian state, not necessarily on the net, is only a constant factor larger with high probability. OK, so now I'm going to switch over to my my final section and the kind of whole purpose of this project, which was to try and look into match gate circuit simulation. So first of all, how do we do match gate circuit simulation? Well, it's, it's very similar to the Clifford case. We take any quantum process we like and we can well, write it as a match gate plus swap circuit. So that should not be a T. Um, then we can gadgetize that circuit to obtain an adaptive match gate circuit acting on n copies of the zero ket and k copies of this magic state m, which remember is on four qubits. Um, we can then decompose m into Gaussian states. And for each term in this decomposition, the quantum process is a match gate circuit acting on a Gaussian state. So for very similar reasons to earlier, this is classically simulable. So this is um, an algorithm for simulation and once again, it's dominated by the number of terms in the decomposition. So we define analogously to the Clifford case, the Gaussian rank, and it's just a minimum possible number of terms in a decomposition into Gaussian states. Um, so in our work, we investigated k equals two and k equals three um, to try and find some low rank decompositions. Um, now actually already it's quite computationally expensive to work with only two and three copies because that's eight and 12 qubits. And when the sort of pioneering work was being done in the Clifford case, they found that going beyond six or seven qubits was very hard to uh, optimize over. And we kind of experienced similar difficulties. So what did we manage to do? On the analytical side, we noted that two copies of the magic state is invariant under a pair of Z operators on either the first two or last two qubits. And now if we impose that same condition on the Gaussian states in the decomposition, we can actually make some progress. And essentially it's because all the constraints that we defined earlier that we saw, you know, we saw one that had four terms in, they actually all collapsed to only having two terms. And we can do a very long and extensive case bash and it's proved that there are no low rank decompositions for symmetry restricted Gaussians. Now we don't really claim that this is necessarily convincing evidence that there is no low rank decomposition for k equals two, but it does show that any, any decomposition will have to be at the very least kind of non-symmetric and maybe surprising form. And on the numerical side, we ran loads of simulations and loads of optimizations over like many thousands of computer hours and we didn't find anything. So we conjecture that there are no low rank decompositions for k equals two or three. Now we kind of view this as a challenge to the community. You know, it, it's well known that uh, the best way to get an answer to a question is to post a wrong answer on the internet. So please do go ahead and find some low rank decompositions. We'd love to be proven wrong. Um, and the kind of conclusion of all this is that any rank-based simulation method for match gate circuits depends on low rank decompositions by its very nature. Um, and these are hard to find. So just to give a quick summary, 
we give the first explicit algebraic constraints obeyed by Gaussian states. We then use those to, for example, prove that the Gaussian fidelity is generally small. And we initiate a study of the Gaussian rank that essentially only give negative results in that area. And looking forwards, I mean, I think it's pretty clear what the outlook is. We really want to find low rank decompositions or fermionic magic states. And if that's not possible, maybe we can prove lower bounds for the sort of non-restricted case or on the rank on a few copies of a fermionic magic state. Yeah, thanks very much for your attention. Okay, any questions? Thank you for the very nice talk. It's a very tricky problem. Yeah. Um, so um, here you looked into, you know, magic states for implementing swap, right, as, mm -hmm. a, as a tool for um, achieving universality in this model. But uh, for, you know, since match, match gate circuits are like inspired by like non-interacting fermions, right, it's really equivalent to that. You know, you could take different routes to achieving universality, different ways of, uh, you know, generalizing the dynamics to like say weakly interacting fermions or something. Um, have you looked at, you know, trying to achieve low rank decompositions of other types of magic in the swap kit? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think um, magic in the match gate case is kind of a lot more subtle than in the Clifford case, because it's not the case that it's either magic or not. There's definitely this kind of continuous spectrum. And I don't think there's been enough sort of studies yet on you know, we have all these magic monotones in the Clifford case. Um, so it would be really interesting to try and see if maybe, maybe swap gates aren't the way forward. Um, I do think once you've translated into the computational like, qubit model, um, since, we, since match gates plus swap are universal, you could always express any other bonus gate you were giving them in terms of match gates and swaps and get back to this. But it's definitely possible that the kind of decompositions would be more visible in that other setting. So I think it's definitely something that could be looked into. Very interesting. Thank you. Hi. Uh, this might be a very basic question about match gates, but like with Clifford. Uh, gates, I can think of like the Hadamard, the CNOT, and the phase is generating this whole structure. Mm -hmm. Is there a similar set of like gates, maybe parameterized gates I can think of as generating the match gate? Yeah, so there are um, sort of finite generating sets. Um, and there's a sort there's a certain model of computation called um, fermionic parity based computation, which explicitly depends on this like finite generating set. Um, it requires a kind of characterization of Gauss, um, of match gates that I didn't actually give in this talk because we didn't really need it. Um, but you can parameterize them by uh, quadratic Hamiltonians in, in Majorana operators. And it turns out that you only need um, pi by four as a phase in your quadratic Hamiltonians, and that actually generates the whole set. Um, so it's not quite as easy to write down like a nice kind of three or four gates, but there is a finite generating set. Thank you. No problem. Any more questions? Uh, can I ask? Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, so you, you didn't find a, a low, a low uh, decomposition, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, you, but you you do have the natural decomposition. It does yeah. give you something, right? Yes. So yeah. Is it? Is it better than uh, Clifford plus T in some circumstances? I mean, that you want to simulate something which is almost completely... Uh, yeah, so I think um, there are certain hardwares out there that are kind of native to uh, match gates. So for example, like Google's uh, two qubit entangling gate uh -huh. is a match gate. So you could definitely argue that actually match gates 
would be the route to go to for simulation rather than translating it into the and clipper did picture. people ever try it as a practical tool to simulate? Uh, yeah, so actually at the same time as our paper came out, two papers very similar um, kind of on the more practical aspect of actually doing the simulations came out. Um, and I think they reported like quite positive results on actually doing the simulations. Uh, whereas we are more interested in the kind of the quantity that controls the cost of it. But there are some applied results here. Any more questions? Okay, so thanks, Mr. Speaker, once again.